It's The Real News Network. I'm Greg Wilpert coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. Colombia held its first round presidential election last Sunday, and the conservative candidate, Ivan Duque, came in first with 39% of the vote. However, since Colombia requires an absolute majority to win the presidency, there will be a runoff vote on June 17th with the runner up of this election, the leftist candidate Gustavo Petro, who won 25% of the vote. This is the first time in modern Colombian history that a left candidate has come this close to competing for the presidency. At stake is Colombia's peace agreement with a FARC rebel group, among many other things. Here's what Ivan Duque, the conservative candidate, had to say about his win and the peace agreement after Sunday's uh, election results were announced. But we need to guarantee that those responsible of crimes are really committed to the country and they don't fall back to their ways. And here's what leftist candidate Gustavo Petro had to say. We have given it our all. We are not playing with fire so as to have a Colombia that is in peace. Joining me now to discuss Sunday's election result in Colombia is Mario Murillo. Mario is professor of communications and Latin American Caribbean studies at Hofstra University, and he is the author of the book Colombia, the United States, uh, War, Unrest, and Destabilization. Thanks for joining us again, Mario. Great to be with you, Greg. Thanks for having me. So let's start with the election result. Um, uh, given that most of the opinion polls predicted this result, more or less, I guess there were no real surprises here, or were they? What would you say? There was a few uh, developments that I think are, are relevant. One, yes, you laid out the, the winners and, and perhaps lo losers in the numbers themselves. Ivan Duque was more or less projected in the many public opinion polls leading up to the vote to have about 38 to 39 percent of the vote, and that's pretty much what he ended up with. Uh, Ivan Duque being, of course, the right-wing candidate of the Centro Democrático, who represents the party of the former president, Álvaro Uribe. And that uh, it was look, and it was already projected prior to the elections that uh, Gustavo Petro, the former mayor of Bogotá, the former M19 guerrilla leader, uh, was going to come in second, the left-wing kind of independent candidate from the left. Um, and so more or less that's what's happened. One of the most interesting developments out of this election was the, the abstention uh, and the concerns that Colombia's electorate has always been pre pretty much disinterested or, or, or have not participated in the way they should. If we go back to the 1990s, it's only since, since the 1990s, only one election, national uh, uh, presidential election, had more than 50 percent of participation in the vote. That was in 1998 when Andres Pastana was elected president uh, back then. Um, but leading up to this vote, there was curiosity as to whether or not the intensity of this campaign, the distinctions in the two primary candidates, was going to lead to a, a, a larger number of voters. And so it turns out that almost 54 percent of the voters in Colombia this time did turn out, which again, it doesn't seem like too much, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big change from the last several years. Uh, we're talking 46, 47 percent abstention. And what it also, another interesting factor related to that is that the left and center left and the center of Colombian politics really won this first round of the election. Even though it's been talked about about how the right won 39% of the vote, if you consider the vote of Gustavo Petro and then Sergio Fajardo, the former mayor of Medellin, uh, as well as the candidacy of De La Calle, who was the uh, peace negotiator with the FARC during the peace negotiations in Havana, uh, Liberal Party candidate, combined, they got all, uh, received almost 9.8 million votes, uh, and we can say over 51 percent of the vote combined. Uh, so that's an indication, one, with the numbers, the increased numbers of voters that participated, most likely you're looking at some of the uh, exit numbers that a lot of the youth that were galvanized, extremely galvanized by Petro's uh, uh, public campaign uh, in the plazas of, uh, all around the country, that there was a call for a new direction uh, and, and a rejection in many ways of the Ivan Duque, Alvaro Uribe conservatism and militarism that we've seen uh, for so many years in, in Colombia. So that's something that we could take away. And now the question is what, what's going to happen now over the next three weeks as we lead up to the second round in which Petro and Duque do face off uh, uh, one on one. Before we get to that, um, what about the fairness and transparency of this election, this last one? Uh, Colombia's electoral transparency agency, URIA, reported over, over 1,000 irregularities in this vote. From what you've heard, how clean was this election? Was that an issue or a problem? 
It depends on where you're where you're uh, uh, getting the reports from and wh in what part of the country. Uh, in in the main urban areas, we didn't see as much, but in some of the uh, rural areas, there was reports of of. Uh, of uh, irregularities. I think uh, there was concern, uh, and Gustavo Petro was uh, raising these issues leading up to the, uh, the, the elections the other day. Uh, some of the CNE, the, 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 the National Council, the Electoral Council, were writing off his concerns as saying that there's, you know, all the issues are being worked out. Um, and that's still being that's still being discussed. I think in any case, in any election in Colombia, there's always going to be concerns about irregularities. And I think the bigger issue right now is is uh, the political uh, stakes that are at hand and whether or not Gustavo Petro, as a left wing, the first real serious viable candidate from the left in Colombia, can build a coalition kind of like a, a, a frente amplio, a broad front uh, of the political center and, and left in Colombia, sort of like what we saw in Uruguay, sort of what we saw in Chile after the dictatorships, in which he can bring these people together and say, we have to do everything we can to stop Uribismo and uh, return to the kind of extreme right uh, militarism uh, uh, of, the, of the last uh, several years, well, certainly before, before Santos' peace accords. Um, and I think that's the big question that we have to be watching over the next couple of days, really. Uh, there's, there's some indication that certain sectors of the Liberal Party, which in many ways the Liberal and Conservative parties, the political establishment, have been completely rejected. It's, I think it's fine. the final nail on the coffin in Colombia's politics. Now this old, this old generation of the two-party system is pretty much uh, out of the way. But there's some sectors of the Liberal Party that are kind of hinting at approaching uh, Duque. But I can't see... Uh, uh, somebody like Sergio Fajardo and the people that have surrounded him, even though there's, there were criticisms of Petro during the campaign and there was distancing themselves uh, ex extensively of the, of the campaign of uh, Gustavo Petro, I can't see them uh, approaching uh, Ivan Duque. And, and for them to take a position of uh, we're not voting and uh, we're not taking any sides in this would be a political disaster. Uh, if Fajardo and Petro could get together and, and De La Calle as the, uh, I guess, smallest vote, but certainly a representative of, of some of that traditional centrist uh, 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 party apparatus, uh, and if they can come to some kind of coalition agreement, I think we might see, uh, for the first time, a, a presidential uh, victory from the from the left and center. Again, that's an, a, that's a, a, a steep hill to climb, given where we are today. Uh, but that's there's still some some optimism that that could indeed occur. I just want to ask you something about the kind of larger historical perspective, because historically, Colombia has always, or not always, but practically always sided with the conservatives and with the far right, essentially, that is, I mean, the, in the elections. Uh, and I guess part of the reason has been uh, Colombia's uh, civil war and and uh, the delegitimation that uh, this has caused towards for the left. Now, of course, with this peace agreement, do you think that the peace agreement is what is opening this path for Petro and uh, that this might represent, uh, because of this, a, a, a historic opportunity for progressive or left forces in Colombia at the moment? I think there's a number of factors that, that lead to the, 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 I think people are tired of war. There's no question. I, I'm not sure if we can necessarily be that optimistic to think that the, the, the conflict in Colombia is totally over, regardless of who wins the election come June 17th. Um, I think there's still so many problems, profound problems in the countryside, attacks against social movement leaders, uh, the issues of land restitution and, 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 and the issues of justice uh, in the wake of the peace accords uh, in which uh, you know that still has not been resolved, and the Congress in Colombia has still been you know slamming the brakes on on, on different uh, uh, issues related to to, to justice uh, in the post accord period. Um, but I think there is generally a feeling in the countryside, and this is something that I can say from anecdotal experience in my last. 18 months of visiting a lot of different regions in the country, from the Caribbean coast to the uh, area of Cauca to, to the northern uh, part of Antioquia, areas that have always been at the brunt of the violence in the countryside. You get a sense that the people in the country do appreciate this end of direct confrontation between FARC and and the uh, and the government, uh, regardless of their concerns about some other specific aspects of the accord. And I think the the ongoing discussion and denunciations and criticisms from the right of those peace accords 
perhaps have not had the traction that they were hoping. Again, this is my this is uh, one take on it. Uh, the the right wing does also have considerable uh, support uh, in the mass media in Colombia. You see a lot of uh, benefit of the doubt given to somebody like uh, Ivan Duque uh, for some of the arguments that he would make uh, around these issues. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, it's still being somewhat optimistic. And, and as you pointed out, Colombia traditionally has voted conservatively over the years. And Alvaro Uribe, notwithstanding his, his being implicated in uh, drug trafficking, his connections with paramilitarism, his, his uh, you know, he's ha he has this incredible code of Teflon that has always kept him from, from uh, uh, losing that base of support that is a, pr a pretty strong base that is representative in Ivan Duque's uh, uh, turnout in the elections on Sunday. Okay, I guess we're going to have to leave it there for now, but we'll definitely come back to you as the campaign develops. I was speaking to Mario Murillo, Professor of Communications and Latin American Caribbean Studies at Hofstra University. Thanks again, Mario, for having you joined us today. Thank you. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.